Six, that's the number of people who were directly involved in the death of Tupac Shakur on the 7th of September, 1996. Of those six, only five were at the murder scene at 11.30 p.m. at the stoplight where the shooting took place. And of those five, only two are alive today, Keefe D and Suge Knight. There's a lot of conceptions and misconceptions concerning what really went down on that tragic night. And fortunately, Keefe D has been singing like a bird ever since the cops gave him a proffer agreement that protected him from prosecution for his confession. Today, we know it wasn't complete protection protection after all. Today, Keefe D is behind bars awaiting trial and might soon find himself facing a very long time behind bars for a murder he could have just shut his mouth about. But what really happened on the night Tupac died? Well, we know enough not to expect nothing from Suge. We know Suge's not gonna say nothing. The sugar bear got his lips on Velcro mode, tight and sealed. So all we have is Keefe. So what really happened to Tupac? What can we learn about Tupac's murder if we explored it through Keefe D's eyes? A proffer agreement is not immunity. People get this confused. There's no immunity in a proffer agreement. All a proffer agreement is is that information that you provide that is self-incriminating cannot be used against you. Keefe D has got to be one of the most inconsistent snitches in the history of snitchery. The man wrote a book, did a BT interview, and went from DJ Vlad to the art of dialogue to my mama's podcast, waffling with glee about his involvement in death of one of the greatest rappers of all time. And yet he's always fumbled over the details of what exactly happened. Like how he says he saw Pac and Suge the day before they took his life. But that couldn't have been possible because Pac and Suge had flown into Vegas on the same day he would meet his demise. So why should we believe a word that comes out of his mouth? Well, we can, because the police have confirmed that he was around the crime scene on the day Pac died. They confirmed through his testimony and the testimony of witnesses who were around the scene. Another reason why we can't throw the baby with bathwater in this regard is because this event happened 25 years ago. Keefe has sang through half of it. So for the inconsistencies, we can blame age, time, and the tendency for Keefe to embellish his story to make himself sound tough. Happens all the time. And lastly, none of his critics have said he wasn't there. They know he was, and that he was the final catalyst for the series of events that led to Pac's gruesome murder. So what were those events? For many, the events that led to the murder of Tupac began on the night of September 7, 1996. But for Keefe D, it began way earlier. It began with a chance meeting with the bad boy exec himself, P. Diddy. You said that um, you was on top of the world until you met Puffy. What you mean by that? Man, yeah, I was getting 300 kilos a month, man. Balling, man. Did nobody know about me? I was, my was smooth, dude. Was laid out smooth, man. I met your and all the heat and thunder come around. I don't need to tell you this after you just saw that clip, but Keefe D isn't exactly chummy with Diddy. In his words, he wishes he'd never met the dude. And Diddy probably feels the same way too, especially when you consider how Keefe has been putting him on a daily blast. However, it doesn't matter because the man who introduced them both, their go-between, was Eric Von Zip Martin, a notorious and highly dangerous Harlem kingpin whose role in Tupac's demise was undisputed. In fact, even if you wanted to dispute it, the facts of the matter, the circumstances that surrounded Diddy, and how he he operated with the underworld, you'd find quickly that there was no way on earth that Diddy would be involved in Pac's death and Von Zip wouldn't be cooking. From 1991 to 1996, Keefe D was Diddy's protection whenever the homie was in Cali. He was his check-in. He did favors for him. Concerts, events, birthday parties. Anytime Diddy had to show up on the west side, Keefe was right by his side. And as you would expect, he was rewarded accordingly. But things were about to change. Every bonfire needs some sort of lighter. And before you're gonna light stuff, you must get some fuel. In this case, the lighter came with the death of this guy, Jake Robles, in 1995. Y'all are aware of the rivalry between Diddy and Suge, Death Row and Bad Boy, the East Coast and the West Coast, so I don't need to get into all of that. What you should know, though, is that Jake Robles was Suge's day one homie. He was his bodyguard and friend, and his death would come as a direct result of a scuffle at Jermaine Dupri's birthday party that both Suge and Diddy attended in Atlanta. To put it simply, the headline on the street was, Diddy's people shot Suge's right-hand man, and it was at that moment that the heat turned up to 11. And they keep telling you, the story of Biggie and Tupac and some shit like that. You never hear names like Jake being included. That death is arguably the most important death in hip hop because usually when these rappers get killed, it was street shit that ended up getting into rap. Jake was the first time rap shit turned into street. Shit. Diddy might have been diabolical in the 90s, but Suge was hardcore, and he wanted blood. Word on the street, Suge wanted Diddy's head. There was no telling what he would do. And there's no conversation out there that really points to how threatened Diddy felt in the beginning. But we can point to the exact moment that hit the fan and Diddy had had enough of running from the sugar bear. The Christmas piss drinking party of 1995. He might have got a few punches, and he probably drunk about 
20 shots of this. You know what I mean? Literally. What you just heard is actual audio footage of Suge Knight admitting to forcing piss down the throat of a friend of Diddy's. The victim here was Mark Anthony Bell. For some reason, and in the heat of this conflict, Mark, who was an employee of Bad Boy, a well-known one, decided to attend a death row Christmas party in Hollywood Hills. It didn't take long for him to stick out like a sore thumb, and the moment Suge saw him, he seized the opportunity by the throat. Suge tried and failed to squeeze intel about where Diddy's family house was in Los Angeles from Mark. I mean, gotta give the man credit. Mark might have been dumb enough to party in hell, but at least he was wise enough to keep his mouth shut. He didn't say nothing. So Suge, Pac, and a couple of death row crew members took Mark upstairs and gave him a beat down before humiliating him by forcing him to drink a couple of shots of his own piss. Now Diddy ain't slow. He knew what this meant. He knew Suge wasn't playing. The death row boss wanted his pound of flesh, and the attempts at figuring the location of his family house meant that the sugar bear wanted to take that pound from where it would hurt. So Diddy decided to go on the offensive, and it is the decision he took next that most people say led directly to Pac's tragic demise. There were two bounties, and the first had to do with a death row chain and a contract sent out to the Southside Crips. Word on the street, Diddy had placed a 10K bounty on death row chains to Southside Crips. Is it true that Puff Diddy had a bounty on the death row chain? No. So like they say, uh, he said it's $10,000. It don't make sense because the chains weren't worth $10,000. It's a little punk ass change worth about five, six hundred dollars back then. Now, this is one of those moments where either Keefe is slow, doesn't know what he's saying, or he's just clearly capping. Because anyone who's heard the story knows that the contract on that chain wasn't about no dollar amount. It was about intimidation, sending a message, and turning Suge and Pac into a target. Diddy was playing territorial chess, and the Crips were the puns. Now, I know there is no evidence to prove Diddy had put out that contract, but even Greg Kading had cause to believe that a bounty had been put out, even though there was no evidence. There's no evidence that. That there was an actual bounty it's not like we have a written contract that somebody produced and go look at there's the here's here's the bounty you know that this is perceptions and if death row people believe there's a bounty on their chains and people are trying to steal their chains which we know happened then there's a reason to believe that it's true. Let's not lie to ourselves. There was a bounty. And whether or not Diddy co-signed it directly, there was no denying he was neck deep in the whole affair. In fact, the person that would snatch the chain was none other than Orlando Anderson. Orlando Baby Lane Anderson was a crip and the nephew of Keefe D and the person he snatched the chain from was a blood and a lil homie in the death row squad. This was the background, the scenery. Now we have all of the pieces in place, the foundation laid. Let's dive into how the Tupac murder went down. It was the night of September 7th, 1996 at the MGM Grand in the heart of Vegas. Everyone that was there was there for one thing, the highly anticipated Mike Tyson boxing match. Even Keefe D, Orlando Anderson and his crew. Tupac Shakur was there along with Suge and the death row crew and the young blood who got his chain snatched. Now the story goes that no one was expecting what was going to happen next. Like I said, no one was originally there to cause trouble. The shit that would go down just presented itself on a platter and it came in the form of Orlando Anderson walking past the death row crew. The young blood who's chain was snatched, spotted Orlando Anderson, and alerted his crew. Tupac immediately took the memo, got personal about the whole affair, and attacked Orlando Anderson. Before he could even know what was popping, the whole death row entourage was popping him. Now, there's something to be said about what inspired Pac to go after Baby Lane the way he did. And for those that believe it had to do with their gang affiliations, I put it to you that you know nothing about Pac. Pac was a thug, not a gangster. He stood up for the little guy on the street. He wasn't waving flags. And I say this knowing well enough he was under Peru blood protection as a result of his affiliation with Suge. What I'm saying is this, when Pac saw Baby Lane, he saw an oppressor and he wanted to put him in his place. Was it rash? Of course it was. Was it wise? Of course it wasn't. Keefe himself would say that the Bloods didn't do enough to hold him back. Sure, Pac was hard to control, but a hit on a crip by a rapper affiliated with the Bloods was a call for war. And Keefe answered that call. Now keep all of this in mind because when it was happening, it was outside Keefe D's sight line. While this was going on in the casino, Keefe D was having dinner with his crew at the MGM hotel that was some couple distance away. We went to eat. We was eating. Man, they came and said, he just beat up Lane. And we was in the hotel. Yeah. We the MGM and the restaurant. It was a few New Yorkers, though. We went to, like, man, y'all need some help. Uh, we got this. 
he heard it. His nephew was beaten up by Suge's crew, and that it was Pac that initiated the beatdown. When Keefe would see Lane moments later, the young blood's shoulder was fucked up by the beating. Now, I'm asking if it was you in that situation, what would you have done in his shoes? Mind you, I'm not trying to justify Keefe D. I'm just exploring possibilities because if your answer to that question was to return the favor, an equal beat down on Pac, you should know that it was probably the original intention. I can't say for certain, but there is a possibility it was. However, two factors were in place that ensured that there would be nothing less than a violent reillusion to the affair. The first factor came in the form of the individuals at Keefe D's dinner. Keefe was eating with Terrence T. Browns Brown, DeAndre Big Dre Smith, Eric Von Zip Martin, and his New York crew. Now you see, the first two names might not have been a problem, but those last two, Eric Von Zip Martin and his New York crew, that was where the real problem began. Because you see, Von Zip was Diddy's right-hand man in the streets. He was beyond a confidant. Some say he was even the godfather of Biggie's son. So he was the custodian of the second problem that complicated that night into a murderous mess. Diddy had placed a million dollar bounty on both Tupac and Suge's head, and Von Zip was the one tasked with facilitating the whole hit. According to Keefe D, Von Zip told him right there about the bounty, offered him a gun, and offered him help in taking out Tupac Shakur. Perfect opportunity, baby. That was Zip talking? Yeah. Because of what happened with Yeah. Well, he told me in the lobby that he had some jimmy. Some what? He had a jimmy. And that being, he had a little secret compartment. The thing popped out. <laughs> Armed with a gun, moving with ill intent, and backed by both his crew and Von Zip's New York crew, Keefe D went in search of Pac. He even got into Von Zip's van while his own crew moved in the Cadillac. And yeah, we must not forget, Orlando had joined them at this point. He was in the Cadillac. They knew where Pac and Suge were bound for after the MGM row. Word was that they would be headed for Club 662 where Pac would perform. So that was where they went. All of them. Keefe D and his crew, Von Zip and his New York crew. They parked in the parking lot waiting for him to show up, but they didn't show up. We waited about 15, 20 minutes, they didn't show up. So it's like, let's go get some liquor. And Corey, oh, they're gonna kill us, dog. You know, that <laughs> you know, got the police killing my and all that. Man, you crazy. We stopped at the liquor store. I got out the van and jumped in the Cadillac. The New York crew had gotten cold feet, and you can't blame them. Pac was at the top of the world at this point. He was uber famous, and this hit was sure going to be the hit of the century. So when Pac didn't show up as scheduled, they began to get scared. Now, it's not particularly clear what Von Zip's reaction was to his own crew's cowardice, but it pissed Keefe enough to go with his own crew to finish the job without Von Zip's direct help, but he still had Von Zip's gun. So where was Pac and Suge during all of this? After Pac had beat up Baby Lane, he and Suge had stopped by their hotel room. Neither Von Zip nor Keefe had factored this in. They both thought the two of them would get on straight to the club. So throughout the time they was waiting in the parking lot, Pac had been deliberating with Suge in the hotel room. A couple of decisions had been made that reduced the witnesses who would have been privy to Pac's killing. And the most important one was that Pac's bodyguard, Frank Alexander, was reassigned to a separate vehicle where the rapper's girlfriend at the time, Kidada Jones, was. But there was more to the delay than just a stop at the hotel room because one hour before 12 on Las Vegas Boulevard, bicycle-mounted police stopped Pac's car for its loud music and lack of license plates. The plates were found in the trunk and the car was released without a ticket. 15 minutes later, Pac would get shot. But hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The last time we left Keefe, they were on their way back after a disappointing wait at the club. So what happened in those 15 minutes that caused Keefe D's path to cross paths? At this point, Keefe himself had given up on the hit and they were all headed home or to the hotel wherever it was. I use the word wherever very cautiously because their paths would cross in the most unlikely of ways. Keefe D saw them first. They was in a BMW and Pac was sticking half his body outside the window, speaking to some women and inviting them to join him in the club that he was now headed to. That was an error that Pac didn't know he had made. Keefe D and his crew didn't know Pac's car or what car they would be in. So there is the possibility that he could have passed them and they wouldn't have known. There is a scenario where Pac would still be alive today, but the error had already been made. And now Keefe and his crew were circling back, ready to finish the job. They weren't going to follow him to the club. They weren't going to wait. They was going to pull the gun on him the first chance they got. But who amongst them was going to pull the trigger? The Cadillac is being driven by Terrence Brown. In the front passenger seat is Keefe D. Behind the driver is DeAndre Smith. And in the right rear passenger seat 
is Keefe's nephew, Orlando Anderson. You could ask why didn't Keefe D just pull the gun himself since he was the one carrying the idea from the jump. Well, that seating arrangement is the reason why not. Because you see, in a couple of minutes, their vehicle was going to pull up to the passenger side of Pac's vehicle at a red light. And since PC was seated right next to Suge, who was driving, and since Keefe was on the other side, there was every chance he would miss. Too much room for error and not enough for a smooth escape. So the next best option was DeAndre Smith, who was right behind the driver. But he turned down the offer. He must have realized how crazy what they were planning to do was. One slight error and they would be dead meat. He wasn't going to be that guy. So who? Who was going to pull the trigger? Well, the answer to that question was Keefe's own nephew, Orlando Brown. I thought he was going to pull on my side. You know, that's my little nephew. I'm going to look out for him. You know, he, he pulled off on his side. So you were going to, you were fitting a blast if you had to, or you were just... Yeah, if we would have been on my side, I would have blasted. Okay. Orlando Brown took the gun, leaned over DeAndre Dre Smith, and shot into Pac's vehicle. Four times. Four bullets. Pac was struck all four times. Once in the arm, once in the thigh, and twice in the chest, with one bullet entering his right lung. Keefe would say that immediately the shooting began. Pac, in shock, tried to jump into the back seat, trying to avoid the bullets. Unfortunately, he had no chance. Meanwhile, there's this rumor that has spread since the incident that Suge used Pac as a human shield. Keefe says it is false. He says that Suge's first instinct was to protect his head and body. They even thought he was dead because he was a bloody mess. He got hit on the head by shards from the bullet. Pac was rushed to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada, where he was heavily sedated and put on life support in the intensive care unit. Five days later, on the afternoon of September 13, 1996, Shakur died from internal bleeding. He was pronounced dead at 4.03 p.m. Meanwhile, immediately after the shooting, Keefe and his bloody gang went drinking. So what happened with the gun? Where y'all stashed the gun? I left it on the tire in one of them cars in the parking lot. What did y'all do with the white Cadillac? Took it back to the rental car place. The very next day, they were out of Vegas. On their way home, Keefe D would tell everyone in the vehicle, including Orlando, that they couldn't say nothing. They had to keep their mouths shut. This was the only way they could stay free and alive, he said. He was right, and they did, for the most part. Baby Lane, the one who actually pulled the trigger, kept denying his involvement up until he died. From 1995 to date, have you ever ridden in a white Cadillac? No. Do you know anyone who owns a white Cadillac? No. Orlando Baby Lane. Anderson would die in an unrelated May 1998 shooting in Compton. The other backseat passenger, DeAndre Big Dre, or Freaky Smith, also kept his mouth shut. He denied any involvement in the pack killing, and he would die of natural causes in 2004. The getaway driver, Terrence Bubble Up Brown, went as far as saying he wasn't in Vegas on the day Pack was killed. Orlando Anderson, of course, was on tape at the MGM, and Keefe D, his uncle, admitted to being there. T. Brown, however, for his part, denied that he was in Vegas that weekend. Don't tell me that you didn't go to Las Vegas. What you're going to tell me, Terry, is who you went there with and where you stayed. Go to Las Vegas. T. Brown was found shot dead from multiple gun wounds at a rundown legal high shop in Compton in September 2015. Suge still won't say a thing and is currently serving a 28-year prison sentence for running over and killing a Compton businessman outside a burger stand in January 2015. And Keefe D. is currently facing trial with a public defense attorney and a possible lifetime of jail time ahead of him.